we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Rachel Wiseman, and I am the uh, recruiting manager for our Cincinnati business unit. Um, this is our first time doing this presentation at Miami, so um, really happy to be here. And again, I appreciate you guys coming out in this weather. Our goal tonight is to really talk about um, the differences, sorry, between consulting and um, industry. Sorry, I have a frog in my throat. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, can, you, can you all hear me? So the intent is to sh tell you a little bit about the differences between consulting and other, st other industry types of jobs that you might be pursuing when you graduate and um, share a little bit about the different types of consulting roles and opportunities that are out there as well. Um, you know, this is really meant to be a very interactive discussion and hopefully somewhat fun. So uh, it's going to be much less of a lecture than it will be uh, information sharing and a dialogue between us. So if you have questions any time during the presentation, please raise your hand and um, we'll make sure to answer those. Um, and then after the presentation, uh, we will hang out here for a little while and if, if you want it to come up and meet any of us and ask us questions that you might not feel comfortable asking in a larger group, that's fine too. Um, so with that, why don't we introduce ourselves. Uh, Rachel, who uh, was up here before, um, she will, uh, she'll be joining us again here in a minute. Um, she is our a recruiter and um, so she deals with um, all sorts of uh, sourcing and recruiting aspects for our Cincinnati business unit. And so uh, a business unit is a, essentially a, a P&L. It's a, it's a business entity within Centric Consulting. And you'll, you'll hear a little more about Centric and, and um, you know, the size of our organization and how we're structured and things like that. Um, Rachel, did you want to say anything else? Or? No, I think, um, you know, as your students going through um, the decision process of you know what you want to do after this. This is a really great opportunity to um, ask questions um, and our goal is for you to leave here tonight to really understand or have a good um, handle on you know again consulting versus industry there's no right or wrong um, both present great opportunities so um, we're happy to be here. Great. Jeff we'll start with you. Jeff, would you like to come up and introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah, I don't think you have to put that right on your mouth. I'm sorry. Um, can I interrupt you just to say, man, we're really happy to have you both here. I'm Jim Kuyper, Chair of Computer Science and Software Engineering. I want you all to know that this company has been a good partner with us over the years. Some alums are hiring us. Uh, and and I, I really am glad to see the group here because I know that some students really don't have an understanding of what consulting is, and it's a great career field. For some of you, for some it isn't, but for some it's perfect. And so this is a good consulting firm. I just want to confirm that they're part of us. They're partners with us. And we're supporting the company. I really appreciate this. So thank you all for coming. Sorry to interrupt. I want to just thank you publicly. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so my name is Jeff Lloyd. I uh, I am not a Miami grad. And I feel a bit badly about that. However, I've recruited a ton of people out of Miami, highly impressed with Miami students uh, all the way through my entire career. So, um, you know, I, I am, uh, you know, really quick past, I, you know, came out of uh, UC as an engineer. I did not want to be an engineer. Um, I didn't realize that until I was graduating, and I jumped right into Anderson Consulting. So my perspective on things is I really wish there had been somebody who could have told me um, what was consulting before I got into it. As it turns out, I really enjoyed it. But uh, our mission here is to really help you guys make an informed decision and understand a little bit more. So will, you, will it be clear as day at the end of this? Uh, probably not. But you have our contact information. We are always you know, mostly interested in not necessarily recruiting you into Centric, but helping you make a decision about is consulting a good profession. So please you know, keep that in mind as we're talking. Uh, but really started Anderson Consulting. I stayed there all the way through uh, Arthur Anderson. I switched over to Arthur Anderson during the middle of my career. And Arthur Anderson went out of business conveniently in uh, 2002. So at that point, I had a, a key decision to make. And that's when I jumped into Centric Consulting, started the Cincinnati office for Centric Consulting, 
which was our second office at the time. And uh, now I spend about 50% of my time helping in Cincinnati and about 50% really helping with other national activities like starting up new offices and things like that. Okay. Good evening. I want to just reiterate what Rachel mentioned. You know, thanks a ton for coming out this evening. I know with the rain and, and some of the weather conditions that it can be, uh, it can be rough. But my name's Steve Bernicke. I've been with uh, Centric for now it's about seven years. Um, I've got about 18 years of consulting experience um, with Deloitte Consulting, Coopers and Library, and Grant Thornton Consulting, of which two of those organizations are no longer around. Obviously, Deloitte Consulting is today. Um, I did take a stint in industry uh, for about two years. Um, I was a director of IT for, and, and process improvement for a manufacturing company in Cincinnati. Um, I took a very similar career path to Jeff that um, I didn't know what consulting was um, when I was looking for a, a employment. Uh, my brother was actually in consulting and I enjoyed listening to what he was doing um, and hence I started pursuing the, the opportunities uh, to join uh, consulting organizations of which I joined Coopers and Libran out of, out of college. Um, I help run the Cincinnati office, uh, and that includes Cincinnati and Louisville, as well as Dayton with Andy Park, and he'll, he'll provide a little bit of, uh, more context as well. Um, and I help just drive business development and delivery uh, across uh, all of our practitioners within the Cincinnati, Louisville, and Dayton uh, area. So again, thank you for coming and joining us, and hopefully uh, we'll have a nice interactive and looking forward to questions and answers, obviously, at the end of the, um, at the, end of the session as well. Thanks, Steve. Hi, my name is Will Riley. I'm the only Miami grad that they brought today. So I graduated class of 2000. Um, loved it here. Glad to be back. Just saw the Armstrong Center. You guys are pretty lucky. That's uh, very cool over there. Uh, the food is great too, but uh, the, the student center is awesome. So um, I uh, graduated in 2000. Like I said, I came out and actually jumped into consulting. Um, I did not want to go to one of the, at the time, the big six type firms. Um, I went to a smaller firm called the Summit Group. Um, when I graduated, it was uh, kind of the bubble was bursting. So the, the company that recruited me was called the Summit Group. By the time I started, uh, they had been bought by a company called Cyber, and then they were going to spin us off as Digiterra. Um, it was an exciting time. I got to play foosball a lot. And uh, I traveled quite a bit, uh, Toronto and, and Chicago. I had some good locations from that standpoint, um, but decided, you know, that I wanted to get into industry. So I actually went and worked for Fifth Third Bank uh, for about 10 years. And uh, it worked in their processing arm that spun off a couple of years ago as well. And I uh, got to know some, some folks from Centric just because we were hiring them in to, to do some work with us and, and was very impressed um, and decided about a year and a half, two years ago to jump over to consulting again. Um, in a model that you know kind of fit my lifestyle at the time too with Centric, so we'll see a little bit of this. But uh, I have four young boys who are excited about going to Miami. Uh, somehow they got the idea that uh, my mom, my, my wife, and I are going to actually buy a house in Oxford and uh, let them go to school here. So um, they're nine and, and six and, and two, so they've got it going. But um, you know, I, I've give you kind of same perspective uh, in a group setting or one on one. You know, I've seen both sides uh, industry for about ten years and, and consulting on two different ends. So. Um, you know, great to be here. Glad to have you guys come out and uh, hopefully kind of give you an idea about a few different things here. So, Andy. Thank you, Will. So I guess when I was up here before, I could have introduced myself. So I'll do that now. Um, my name's Andy Park, and um, as Steve mentioned, uh, he and I and another one of our partners manage our Cincinnati, Dayton, and Louisville practice. And um, you know, I, I've had a very you know. Similar experience to, to Jeff and Steve in that I've worked in large, uh, large consulting firms, or a large consulting firm, and now a smaller consulting firm. Um, I started in industry. Um, I am a UC grad. I know that's also probably depressing, but um, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I went into school um, other than I knew that I was pretty darn good in math and science. And I thought that engineering might be a path to get me to either engineering or analytics or um, um, even marine biology or even medicine. And um, so I felt like I had a lot of opportunities um, open to me. And as I got more and more into engineering, and the type of engineering I was in was industrial engineering, so it was very business uh, focused, uh, very process oriented. And I, I found that I really liked it. 
and in fact, I ended up staying an additional couple of years at uh, UC to get a master's degree, um, focusing on quality, assurance, and safety. So after I graduated, I went to a small company in Springfield, Ohio called Rital Corporation. They were a manufacturing company. And um, I was the uh, quality manager and safety director and manufacturing engineer and probably three or four other hats that they could pin on me because I was the new guy out of college. Um, and I liked it. It, it, was, it was a lot of hard work, too. Um, and after about three years, uh, I ran into some people who happened to be playing softball in, uh, in and around Dayton. I was living in Kettering. And um, I decided to give Anderson Consulting a shot. And I went and interviewed with Anderson Consulting and ended up working there for about eight years. Um, uh, you know, when travel finally started wearing me down and I wanted to spend time, you know, in Cincinnati with, the, with my family that I was starting, um, I decided that it was time to get off the road. And uh, that's when I talked to Jeff at Centric and, and came on board at Centric. And that was um, a little over 10 years ago. Um, the other thing I'd mention, and I, a number of us have similar experiences, but um, I'm, I'm a, a huge proponent of the uh, co-op or internship program. You know, it's required at UC, at least in engineering at the time it was. Um, and I encourage you to explore internship opportunities because it gives you, you know, real um, practical experience in industry and that, that carries a lot of weight when you're talking to potential employers as you're getting ready to graduate. Um, it also gives you kind of a heads up as to what seems like it's a good fit and what might not be a good fit and that's okay too. Um, you know, just because you're interning with a particular company doesn't mean you have to end up working there. Um, so that's, that's me. Uh, you know, I love working at Centric. Again, I've been here over, over 10 years, and um, we do some pretty, pretty cool things for companies uh, around this area. And we can probably provide some examples of those as well. So with that, why don't we get into the presentation. Does anybody have any questions at this point? OK, great. So the objectives of our conversation today um, one is to provide an overview of consulting as a career option. Um, also talk about different uh, career paths with consulting. <coughs> and then um, try to relate uh, relevance of some of your current studies to uh, consulting career opportunities. And I think one of the requests that uh, was made of us was to um, provide some examples of how different disciplines <coughs> Um, different majors that you might be in can ultimately translate to a consulting career. It doesn't always have to be math or science or computers um, or finance or in, any, any one of those. It could be uh, all of the above. And um, we've, we've got some uh, examples to share with you there. So what is consulting? Um, the reason why con consulting seemed very natural to me coming from an engineering background is that, you know, engineering is very analytical. Um, it's all about solving problems and getting to the root cause of, of a situation, um, you know, trying to break down a very complex problem into simpler parts that are, you know, manageable chunks. It's like that old adage, you know, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? You know, it's one bite at a time, right? Um, so um, I, I would say that's, that's a pretty good definition of what consulting is all about. It's solving problems for our clients. Uh, it's definitely challenging. Um, I remember joining Anderson Consulting as an experienced hire, and that was pretty new uh, for that large consulting firm. Typically, they like to hire people right out of college. But they, um, for some reason, they had this program where they were trying to bring on more experienced hires to inject some different industry experiences into their, into their uh, lines of business. And um, one of the things I noticed right off the bat was when I joined Anderson, uh, they essentially cut my experience level uh, or, you know, equivalent experience level in half. <clears throat> and I had a real problem with that. I said, you know, I've co-op for two years, I've been working as an engineer for three years, and you're only going to give me two years of experience, and the rationale was, and I understand it much better now, uh, you tend to learn at a very accelerated rate in consulting, 
because you're thrown into all types of situations that you wouldn't normally experience um, in that shorter time frame. So it's different types of people, it's different types of industries, it's different types of problems. Um, and so that, that was their rationale and um, I, can, I can see that in a way now. Um, it is dynamic. Uh, I know that we have, uh, we've hired some, some people at Centric that, that came from an industry role, uh, whether that be a, an, a, um, an analytics person at a, at a financial institution, a project manager uh, from a healthcare organization. And <clears throat> one of the things that, that we help them uh, cope with is just this very dynamic nature of what it is we do. <clears throat> and you know, every day is not the same. In fact, every day is typically different. So when somebody asks us uh, what we do in a particular day, um, it's difficult to answer because it's different every day. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna, I, I will hand the mic over to Jeff because I love when he talks about us being business doctors. So <clears throat> my problem is I will typically talk for a long time in recognizing that you're all here this evening thinking that no, we're gonna be out of here at 7.30. I will be faster. However, the business doctor thing is, uh, so I told you when I came out of college, didn't want to be an engineer, figured all that stuff out. So I thought I'd go on to medical school because doctors make a lot of money, I thought. And, uh, and I like the idea of helping people. I like the idea of fixing problems and taking my engineering skills and doing that. And what I really kind of figured out over time, accidentally, because I just, I, didn't, I couldn't handle any more school. I could not handle, you know, eight more years of school. Um, Consulting is so much like going to a doctor, and you know, you said analogy because everybody in this room, I'm assuming, can relate to it. And if you think about your favorite doctor or somebody that you really trust, you know, what is it that makes that doctor good? You know, wow, just a great, uh, you know, bedside manner, whatever you want to call it, a great demeanor, really good at asking the right questions, making me feel comfortable, making me feel uninhibited in terms of, you know, trying to, I'm not embarrassed about answering certain questions, all that stuff. Every single part of it is relevant in consulting. Um, and the cool part of it is what you're really doing is you're just, nobody's calling you to tell you how great their business is. They're not calling you to say, man, my company is just humming and ticking. Do you want to come and take a look? They're calling you because nothing's working the way they want it to. Uh, we're not making the money when our profits are down. So you're always going in when somebody's got a problem, which can be depressing, or you know, the glass is half full. This is a great opportunity to make somebody's life better. So, Think about that. If you're thinking about medical school, this might be a more accelerated path to, to kind of scratch that itch. So um, I, I, I'm going to let you go. So I get to what? 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so consultant, so we, we have to throw in some, uh, some slides in here just to try to generate a little bit of laughter here. But um, interesting enough, you know your consultant when you know the front desk clerks at the hotel know you by your first name. And that is not just domestic, that's also international, because it's happened to me before. On some international assignments, they would call me by my first name, walk in the door. You use paradigm or robust in a sentence, I do it every day. Your resume looks like a phone book, because of the number of projects that you're working on, absolutely is relevant. Um, and someone asks you what you do for a living and you cannot answer the question. I think Andy and Jeff both alluded to that. My family asks me all the time and they give me their PC and say, can you fix my PC? And I have no idea how to fix a PC. Um, but that is a common, common question we get every day. And it is a tough discussion to have when your family, your parents, siblings, et cetera, ask you what you do and you try to explain to them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I go to a client. What do you do at a client? And it just goes on and on with the question. So it can be tough, um, as Jeff and, and Andy alluded to earlier. Hey, you're rolling. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the rewards that you can experience as a consultant? Um, we talked about the variety of work, uh, excellent learning environment. Um, of course, clients expect you to bring some of that subject matter expertise to the table as well. Um, but I think for any of you who have uh, helped facilitate a you know, presentation, a class, you've had to present in front of a group, you know, you go through a pretty intense learning curve as you're pulling those materials together and you're, you're preparing for that presentation. By, by, um, by facilitating and by presenting, you actually tend to learn you know, at an accelerated pace. So 
There's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, diversity to situations, clients and industries. You work with some really fantastic people who are loving and caring and um, they just they want you to be successful as well as themselves. And then you work with some people who think you're uh, overpaid and all, all you're doing is telling them what they already know. And you know it's a complete opposite side of the spectrum. And it's all different types of people. And to Jeff's point about you know bedside bedside manner and um, you know uh, conveying a level of comfort and ease and um, you know, being able to connect with that client, uh, you have to be able to do that with any any client. Um, <clears throat> opportunity to build professional and team building skills. Uh, I've always believed that as, a, as a, um, a team lead or a project manager, you know, I'm never successful unless my team's successful. So it's all about um, trying to leverage the strengths of people on your team to make the project and, and ultimately the client successful. Um, <clears throat> the, the other thing that maybe isn't, oh, it is actually mentioned there, the, the last bullet point. The professional networks that you develop are just amazing. <clears throat> to this day, a lot of um, you know a lot of the conversations that we have in and around Dayton, Cincinnati, and Louisville are with um, past colleagues from any any one of these you know consulting firms that we we've mentioned up here. Uh, that those networks tend to last. People understand you know your value your core values and and they trust you and and that's a great network to have uh, in case you want to move on to somewhere else in life um, and then knowing that you uh, directly impact a business and 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 um, this this concept of you know kind of diversity and the types of companies industries that you work with it's really important but it's also neat to work at large companies and small companies and understand um, how the time you're spending, the value you're adding, impacts those, those organizations in different ways. I personally love working with small and, and mid-sized companies because the impact is, is generally much more direct and much more visible, and you, and you see the results more quickly. Um, and that, that, that really excites me. Um, challenges. I mentioned trying to get off the road. Uh, I loved it when my Marriott and my Delta points were just skyrocketing and I could take vacation for free anytime I wanted to. That was awesome. Um, you know, what the problem is that after a period of time, you tend to get burnt out. Um, not everybody does, but some people do. And, and the other thing I learned is at different stages in your life, you have different needs and different things tend to make you happy. And, and I think maintaining that work-life balance for an extended period of time in, in uh, consulting can be, can be challenging. Um, I also mentioned this concept of clients thinking, you know, you're this overpaid outsider that's coming in just to tell me what I already, already know. Um, that perception as an outsider is sometimes t tough to overcome. And I don't know how many of you <coughs> have seen, uh, was it The Office? What was the one with the Bobs? Space. Office Space. You know, if you've, if you've never seen that movie, you have to check that out because the, there, there's these two guys, the Bobs, and that's a pretty, you know, typical, you know, vision of a, of a consultant, um, though not necessarily accurate. Um, and then always trying to be the expert. Um, I've learned that listening is often much more important than trying to share, you know, try to impress people with how much you know. Um, as we all know, social media, LinkedIn, it, it's everywhere. You will find, as you look for jobs, probably most of you are going to tap into your network um, and your LinkedIn. Be very intentional about who you link in with. Um, social media, be very careful what you're putting out on Facebook. These are just some things that, um, you know, we as employers, you know, we, we look at. So just be very selective and intentional about, you know, I know a lot of people want to link in with everybody, which is great, but just be very intentional and selective with who you link in and um, to maintain those relationships. And again, with the social media networks, just be very cautious that, um, you know, again, what you're, what you're putting out there, your future employers could potentially see. So keep that in mind. And you know the other thing I'd say, LinkedIn is a great tool to use. It's not 
about volume, mm -hmm. it's about quality. This is your network. This is something you're going to leverage the rest of your life. So when you're doing it, um, you know, you try to have policies. As, you know, if somebody invited you to, to link with them on LinkedIn, that's probably not a good enough policy. Um, I typically like to think that I will have met that person face to face and had some type of interaction. Doesn't mean I know them extremely well necessarily, but now we've had the, the opportunity for me to talk, ask questions, who they are, what they're about. Um, I will use that as a gateway to accepting a LinkedIn invitation. Great. So we won't cover all, all of these points. I'll try to hit on a, a few of them so we can uh, keep the presentation going because we still have a lot of material, I believe. Um, extrovert is probably too strong a word. Um, I think, you know, outgoing, willing to connect with people, uh, openness, uh, um, ability to come out of your comfort zone, you know, um, it's maybe a better way to describe it, but, um, you know, people, in order to connect with your clients and connect with your teams, uh, you have to be, um, interested in making friends and building relationships. Um, contrary to what uh, my, you know, some people as I was growing up told me about um, not sharing everything you know because, um, you know, your job could it be at risk, right? This is fear of job security. Uh, consulting, it's really important to develop those relationships uh, and know what to share when. Um, being quality oriented and value driven, we use the word value like nonstop. I know Steve mentioned paradigm. We talk about value all the time. And it's, you know, if I'm spending this much money on consulting services, what is my return on that investment that I'm making? That's, that's the value equation. Um, professional and communication, style and appearance. Um, I think, you know, they, people tend to look at, at consultants as um, professionals um, that can blend into any. Uh, culture, any organization, and you know, some organizations are suit and tie, uh, much fewer than when I got out of college. Um, most are business casual, and you have to kind of be able to adjust and, and be a professional within that organization. Um, and then work ethic. This is what I really like about Centric, is that um, it's much easier to um, maintain a high, uh, you know, level of work ethic and integrity. Because, you know, we're not out there to try to make money as much as we are to help people. I really believe that. Um, larger firms, um, I think, genuinely try to do that as well. But they're also driven by the need to grow and support a pretty significant, you know, infrastructure overhead. And so I think um, it's probably much more difficult working in one of those larger firms to to balance these things, some of these uh, work ethic uh, aspects in, in a larger firm. Um, Self-motivated and tenacious, um, consultants tend to want to be driven, they, they, they want to, you know, climb the next mountain, they want to achieve the next greatest thing, and they're always looking for, for challenges and problems to solve. Um, in fact, you know, the thing that I, um, and this is probably not completely accurate, but I tend to view people in a couple of different categories. They're e either problem identifiers or solution identifiers, right? It's the people that, um, that have the half full or half empty glass view of life. Um, consultants tend to be more of the half full glass. Um, and then do what it takes attitude, you know, failure is not an option. So let's, uh, any questions? Yes. So the question was, um, do we have an example or can we provide a, a scenario of what, what a, a typical day in the life of a consultant would be? Is that correct? Yeah. I will pick on Will to answer that question. So I'll tell you what I did today. How's that sound? <laughs> they they want to know. Uh, sorry. So, um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it, it can vary greatly, right? And, and so I've been on, on the industry side too, but, um, w which also can. But So uh, today, um, I'm on a project out at a client. They're an insurance company here in Cincinnati. Um, I am helping them run from a project management standpoint. 
uh, business process engineering and, and organizational change around a larger effort where they're putting in a new compensation system and just really upgrading their technology. They're going to have, um, you guys wouldn't believe it, but they do a lot of work on paper still and people fax stuff. Um, we're putting in a new system that's going to allow them to do a lot of electronic onboarding and bring on new producers from that standpoint. So that's my role. What that looked like today was um, got in, went through uh, you know, several different planning exercises with the team that's underneath me um, working on these business processes, right? So at a high level, kind of explaining what the bigger picture is and then breaking it down into smaller work breakdown groups. Um, so for instance, onboarding versus compensation, right? And I've got a couple of different resources that are really the client resources that are going to do that next level of work. And so I sat down with them and reviewed those different processes, went through all their different questions with them, went through what was going to be the deliverables, right? So they've got uh, you know, process maps they're going to deliver, business requirements, business rules. Um, we also talked a lot about the individuals they need to work with and the resources from that standpoint. So the resource availability, et cetera. Um, you know, and that was kind of my morning. Then I had lunch with a different person at that client that's in their IT shop, talked to her about what, you know, to what, what Andy and these guys are saying. What, uh, what is she struggling with? We've got a couple folks in there working on different projects. Her boss just uh, decided to leave and move on to another company, trying to understand what else is on her plate, what is she struggling with, what else can we help her with, if anything. Um, and then went back up and, and worked with a few other clients on getting some of that work done. And then I left early to come here to go to the Armstrong Center, which was nice to be able to walk out and leave and do that kind of thing too, right? So when I was in industry, I, I never did. I left at 7 o'clock at night when I left Fifth Third. So gives you a little bit different flexibility. Does that help? Okay. I, we could give a million scenarios. You want to know what I had for breakfast? I didn't have it. Yes, sir? You said industry. Can you explain that a little bit too? Sure, we hit that, uh, and there's a couple slides coming up on it, right? So I gave my background, uh, I, I started in consulting, and I actually did, uh, I never thought I would, but I, I coded COBOL for two years. So I traveled, I went in and out of other client sites to help them install different ERP systems. Um, then I went over to work for Fifth Third, right? So Fifth Third, I would say industry, right? So if I'm working for the client, um, I did a lot of operations work for the bank. I uh, worked in their processing arm, worked in some internal process improvement teams, some different client deliverable type teams, um, ended up working up and managing, really having accountability for all of the onboarding of new customers and their maintenance from that standpoint. Um, and then I went back into consulting. So instead of working for Fifth Third, now I work for Centric, and I go in and out of all sorts of different clients from that standpoint. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll let Andy go back. Thanks. Um, we have a couple slides on the differences between a larger firm and a smaller firm. Um, I can probably blow through this in one minute and a half, one and a half minutes. Um, large firms, as you can imagine, in order to deliver uh, high quality, deliver consistently, require a high degree of standardization. In fact, um, when I was at uh, Anderson Consulting, they, they referred to us as androids because we were all very similar. We all had the same methodology, and that structure is very important to larger consulting firms. Uh, they typically have an up or out career path model, meaning that I am constantly being compared against my peers. I am constantly uh, collaborating and competing against my peers. And uh, when I reach a certain number of years experience at a certain level, the expectation is that I'm either promoted um, or consulting might not be the best place for me. Um, so that's typical model in, in a larger consulting firm. They pay well. Um, uh, you know, they, you tend to have an accelerated pay scale compared to, to, compared to other professions. Um, the client focus, as I mentioned before, high revenue potential. Some Consulting firms like Accenture, Deloitte, IBM, they focus almost exclusively on the largest companies and they try to make as much money as possible at those companies. Because what you learn is um, in consulting, you can tend to spend as much time fostering the relationship at a smaller company uh, or more than you do at a larger company. So if you're talking about getting, as a consulting firm, the best return on your investment, you're going to target those larger companies. That's typically the model that larger companies follow. Uh, 
Um, Centric's unique business model. Uh, we are very focused on uh, the community. We do a lot in the community. In fact, we're um, just recently recognized uh, by Medical Mutual with a Pillar Award, um, which is a community service award. Um, we value work-life balance, and we go out of our way to do the right thing for our uh, employees as well as our clients. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's really kind of a, it's a special type of um, you know, consulting mo uh, model. Uh, and, and I know Jeff has alluded to it as kind of the consulting utopia, if there was such a thing a couple times. Uh, and I tend to agree with that. Um, integrity, innovation, uh, philanthropy, diversity, our culture is core to everything we do. And, and a lot of companies talk about that. It is truly what differentiates uh, Centric in, our, in the consulting uh, landscape. Um, we prioritize relationships over revenue and, and doing the right thing for the client at all times. Um, we also afford consultants with the opportunity to drive your own career. So, you know, what are you interested in? Are you interested in analytics? Are you interested in merger and acquisitions? Are you interested in uh, developing mobile applications? Um, so many different possibilities. Um, and it's really, um, the career path is really driven by your interests at Centric and, and um, your ability to contribute to our clients and to growing our company. Um, the, other, the other important thing about, share, uh, about career path is sharing the wealth. Um, we, have a, um, we have a compensation model that actually re rewards people based on, uh, based on merit and based on uh, the contribution to our clients and to our our practice, and um, it is very important to us that people are fairly compensated commensurate with you know, that value they're bringing um, to, to our company and our clients. And then lastly, um, you know, we, we do, uh, our, our ideal client is one that views us as a, uh, as a trusted advisor, a strategic partner, not a vendor uh, selling you know, services, um, but it's that, it's that true partnership type of model. Jeff, I'm going to let you talk about this a little bit. Question. question, yes. On the slide before the last one, <coughs> larger firms have limited entrepreneurial opportunities. I wonder if you could unpack that a little. So the question was, larger firms have limited entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. And I'm surprised I didn't use the word entrepreneurial with Centric, as I described it, because normally that comes out in everything I talk about when it, as it relates to Centric. Um, because there's so much structure and such a, a defined career path at larger consulting firms, um, there tends to be you know, a set of tracks or channels that you flow through um, at the larger firms. And so um, coming up with an idea to launch uh, a new service, a new offering, an offering of services, a new product, uh, taking a new idea and just running with it and building it and seeing it from kind of ideation all the way through to, you know, uh, an, operation, an operating model. Um, you know, typically the people who are involved in those types of things are the, are the strategists at the larger firms. And they tend to pull in people where they need, you know, on their team to make those things happen. But the real entrepreneurial stuff is typically happening at the highest levels in those organizations. Um, other, you know, the, the, most of the other work that happens is truly more delivery, you know, project delivery oriented type work. Does that help explain? Centric is different in that um, any one of us can have an idea. Um, certainly it has to be, you know, vetted out. It needs to be discussed. But, you know, those ideas can uh, come to fruition. They can become a reality. Uh, if you champion that and drive it and rally people around it, um, so it's it's truly very entrepreneurialistic, um, and it helps grow our company. That's how we've grown. Um, who we are, and I, I, are we going to distribute this presentation to them? We can. Uh, we can make the presentation available to you. There's a, there, there there are a number of words on here. I think the key is. Uh, to get a flavor for the relative size, we're just under 100 million. We are a virtual organization. Even though we have some office space, it's not technically an office. Um, we 
we have, uh, we were founded in 1999. Uh, we actually have, that's a bit dated, the number of employees. We have closer to 500 uh, employees. Not counting India. India. Not, not counting India. But we're, uh, we're actually in the process of uh, acquiring or acquiring a, an Indian firm that's been a long time partner of ours uh, that will become Centric India and there, there are approximately 200 employees there as well uh, so, we, so that we have an offshore capability. Um, we have a number of locations uh, referred to as business units and you can see, probably tough to see, you could probably see it better on the map but uh, Cincinnati, Columbus, Indianapolis, Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis, Boston, and we have Tampa and Miami as well. We also have two national practices. Uh, we have an Oracle practice that specializes in Oracle ERP and database management. And we also have a, uh, a practice that, that focuses on uh, energy and utilities. And those, those are uh, uh, business units that tend to travel uh, to find you know, the work versus focusing on a local geography to deliver work. Yes? <laughs> so the question was, can you elaborate on your workspace? Okay. Um, so being a virtual company means a couple of things. It means relatively low overhead. It means um, uh, having a need for virtual collaboration, meaning an infrastructure that supports virtual collaboration. Um, and we do that from our workspace, which is typically our client site. Uh, so that's, that's our workspace. Um, the other place people might find themselves working is home, where the client environment permits it, where it might be a remote support type of arrangement. People can actually work mm -hmm. from their homes as well. Um, the other version of workspace is um, it's what we call a solution center. And a solution center is essentially rented space. It's a, it's a client site away from the client site where we have uh, teams of people supporting our client, client's processes and systems. So, uh, for example, one of my clients is in Livonia, which is outside of Detroit. And uh, we don't have an office. We don't have a business unit in Detroit. Um, so what we do is we have a team uh, that f fluctuates anywhere from 6 to 20, depending on the types of projects that are going on, working in downtown Montgomery. Um, in what we call our solution center and we support uh, their pro business processes and their systems from that location. So it's a client side away from the client site. Great. Uh, Will, can you talk about consulting versus industry please? Sure. So we touched on this a few times already and I won't uh I won't read all these to you, but um, we've, we've hit kind of that left column a lot about consulting, right? And, and, and what we've talked to to this point about it being, you know, quicker pace, uh, more challenging, potentially not seeing full life cycles, uh, you know, coming in and working on certain aspects of a project and then moving on to the next. Um, the industry side, you know, I, I definitely saw this. I did this for about 10 years with the bank. Um, it, you know, it's, it's definitely what I would say more climbing, climbing the corporate ladder, right? Um, I came in, I had a defined job, I knew what it was, I knew that if I did that well, you know, the next opportunity was to be promoted to the next level or manager level, um, and I could continue to kind of climb through that, that pace. Um, what I'd call out here that I thought was, you know, interesting on these bullets is, um, you know, definitely the extended tolerance for learning. A consultant comes in, I expect them to be able to give me, uh, you know, results quickly. I expect them to know what they're talking about. Um, when I trained or I hired on people, you know, I knew there was a little bit longer training curve. I was going to get them up to speed, um, you know, and, and that was just part of kind of industry. There was that pace, maybe that more formality around here's how we're going to train you and teach you how to do this job or equip you with the right skill sets to do that. Um, and, it, and it created a really well-defined career path for folks and they kind of knew what they did. They came in in the morning and they processed applications, right? Um, the focus is a lot on that. It's on operations. It's what does that company do for a living? What do they do to make money, right? So we did that and we kind of did a lot of repetitive work. Um, frankly, it's one of the reasons I left, right? I, I bounced through my experience and, um, and did several things with that company. Kind of worked on both sides of their business, primarily in operations, did some consulting, did some you know, internal consulting and some business process improvement groups. Um, but really felt like I had kind of experienced what I could in that industry, but didn't give me the chance to go into 
insurance or manufacturing or another area, right? So um, it was definitely something that, uh, you know, I, I could make my voice heard and I could move through different pieces of that company. But uh, if I really wanted to get into a fast-paced environment, get in and out of a lot of different industries, um, consulting gave me that opportunity. It's why I've you know, flipped over and gone to Centric from that standpoint. I wanted to get out and I wanted to do more um, entrepreneurial things. I wanted to get out and do more business development. Um, I was in operations, so you know, I got to go out on sales calls once in a while, and they would kind of point to me when someone asked, like, how does it really work type things. Um, but I wanted to get out there, I wanted to do more proposals, get on the front side of selling that, do more customer interaction from that standpoint. So, Consulting really gives you kind of that other side of that, gives you a lot more opportunities, especially to Andy's point at a smaller firm uh, like Centric than it maybe does at a larger firm. This one already drew a couple questions. Are there other questions about industry versus consulting? All right. I didn't do tier one, so when you asked to talk about it. Jeff, you're Mr. Tier one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so one thing, I don't know if you picked it up, I mean, but uh, we, Obviously, there's a bias towards centric consulting, right? It's the consultant's utopia, best thing in the world. We believe that. Um, we love tier one consulting. I mean, it's, it is a tremendous pedigree. Uh, I think it's you know, the smartest thing that I did in coming out of school was going into Anderson Consulting. There are, now there were big eight firms at that point. Um, the, you know, it's big four now, so a little different, but you had a lot of options then. They're, they're a little bit narrower today, but. Uh, it is incredible the amount of learning you can do in a very short period of time. Tier one firms will just dump a ton of dollars into getting you trained as quickly as possible. So Andy talked about turning us into androids. I mean, that was their mission. They sent us to St. Charles, ran us through this little factory, which was, I think it was an old um, women's college. And it was the coolest place to go ever because there are people from across the globe and they, we all went in there and came out of there thinking and saying the same things. We would walk onto project teams. You could take people from anywhere across the world and boom, they just sit there and they start working together. They know what a, you know, all the different form names and numbers were. So really cool stuff. Um, you know, it's, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the, you know, the tensions and the pressures associated with the tier one firm. Um, there were times that I was reading the night before what I was going to be teaching the client the next day. Um, and that's, you know, it's kind of, it's cool and it stinks at the same time. Um, but you're, you're, you're learning, there's pressure, there's a little bit of anxiety, but you, you continue to push forward. The big firms offer great, great opportunities to do that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I think the other thing that I'd say on here, you know, tend to be big projects, and they tend to want you to be really good at something. And uh, you know, in a smaller firm, you might need to be a little bit more versatile. Um, bigger firms, the better you are at one thing, if you're the best in the world at what you do, I can charge a fortune for you. You know, people are willing to jack the, you know, the bill rates way up because you're the best at everything. Um, so big firms really try to get you focused and skilled in a lot of things like that. It's really smart. And it, for somebody who really wants to specialize in one particular area, that could be a really good thing. Um, Andy talked earlier about faster promotions and stuff like that too, that up or out mentality. They really try to move you. They want to very quickly get you through there so they can get your bill rates up as well. Um, and I say it like it's all dollar driven. It's not necessarily, but there's a, it's just a, you have a lot of motivated people that are working um, to kind of prove themselves relative to their peers. So you tend to really kind of accelerate and climb that ladder fast. Uh, the cons we talked about you know, a lot of them, um, lots of travel listed as a con. Somebody else could say that's a pro. Um, you know, it depends on where you are in your life. Coming out of college, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, the downside was I went to all the crappy places. So, um, yeah, I did manufacturing distribution type work and all the plants happened to be in really small, uh, kind of dirty towns. I won't give any names because somebody's probably from one of them or something. Um, I am too, actually. The uh, you know, narrow specialization, same thing. You could look, somebody might invert these things a little bit, pros and cons. Um, narrow specialization could be really awesome for somebody. I hit a certain stage in my career where I wanted to do more things. I wanted to take an array of skills and go solve some problem based upon those groupings of experiences. I like the idea of being able to uh, walk into a client and solve multiple needs 
versus, um, oh, I need to call you know, person X, Y, Z because they happen to have the answer to that question. Um, it's fun to kind of start being able to be a little bit more of a uh, universal problem solver. So you can go, you know, you can kind of go shallow across a lot of areas, but maybe only deep in a couple. Um, politicking, politics are bigger in a bigger firm. Uh, they just, they are. And uh, your ability to move and advance yourself, you know, as much as you like to think, it's based solely on, hey, if I'm awesome and I'm doing a great job, you know, all the right things will happen for me. There is a component of influence that comes from who you know or how they know you. So you always have to be aware of that and you have to make sure that you know, the true essence of who you are, what you're about, and what you're capable of doing, people know about it. And the farther you go through your career, especially as you start getting to that partner level, it is really significant and really hard. There's a big chunk of time that really gets spent kind of uh, presenting yourself to you know, the, the right people so that they will promote you at the right times or make you a partner. Um, it's not horrible, but it's, prob it's just the smaller the firm, you know, the less likely it is for politics, and it's a little bit, everybody kind of knows each other. Um, I think that's, that's probably the big stuff. I'm sure you've probably read those things. Is everybody okay with that? any questions? You want me to go still? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, great question. So the question was, how long are the, the travel trips? Uh, so for you know, individual um, trips that you might take, um, it could vary depending on what the project is that you're involved with. Um, what you'll find is in a larger firm, it's fairly common that if you're working at a client who is in a different city, um, you'll likely have the option to go out on Monday morning and come home on Thursday night. Um, Sometimes that depends a little bit on the travel logistics. Sometimes it depends on when the client needs you on site. But on the average, that's, that's about what it is. There are some times where you can uh, get off-site projects as well. But uh, I say, for the most part, the average would kind of lead towards that four-day-a-week model. Uh, weekly, typically. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a, maybe a spectrum of examples. Not only uh, travel time per week, but maybe duration of project. So um, there were cases where I was on a project for multiple years. Um, there was a case, and was, this was actually my first project in consulting. Uh, and I will remember this to, to you know to the end. Um, I uh, I was so excited. I was staffed on a project, and I went up to Cleveland. And this, this client was a huge project. It was one of the largest Centric had ever done. And I had an apartment in the flats, which was at the time like the place to be in Cleveland. And um, checked my bags into this place, had a um, car pick me up. And I thought, man, I, I had arrived. <laughs> you know, I'm a consultant now. I show, <laughs> I show up at the client site and ran into a familiar face who happened to be one of the managers on the project. Uh, her name is Diane. She lives in Cincinnati. One of my neighbors, actually. And um, she said, "Could you, Andy? Could you go sit in the other room just for a minute?" I said, "Sure." I'd literally been in in uh, Cleveland for about four hours. She came back in and said, "I'm sorry to tell you this, but you've been descoped from the project." <laughs> First of all, I had no idea what scope was. <laughs> so I said, "What? What exactly does descoped? I knew it wasn't good." What exactly does descoped mean? And she said, um, your role is no longer needed on the project. Um, so literally, I was home by that night. That was the shortest duration project I'd ever been on. Um, other examples, you know, I, um, unlike Jeff, I got to go to all the cool places. I was in uh, New York and Boston and uh, a couple different places in California, uh, including working with winemakers to refine bulk wine manufacturing processes. Um, I worked in New Zealand for six months. I worked in Australia for six months. And I helped build a module with SAP, which is a big ERP company, uh, in Germany for three and a half months, something like that. So these are pretty cool experiences. And if, if it's you know that time in your career when you can do that and you're into that kind of stuff, it is the most awesome experience you could ever hope for. 
um, especially because all of your expenses are paid and you're racking up all the points and miles. And you're meeting interesting people from all over the world. So um, those are some of the really great things I, I take away from Tier 1 firms as well. I was in Seymour, Indiana for a year. Um, <laughs> does anybody know the significance of Seymour, Indiana? John Cougar Camp. Anybody out here? Does anybody know who John Cougar Camp is? Um, it's, so it's still a decent place to go. Um, you know, you can almost take these and say, wow, you took the previous slide and just inverted them. Because um, we tend to have a little bit of a bias and say that the, all those things that are, you know, cons on the big firms have to be great for us. It's, um, it depends on what you like. But I would say that um, there's an ability of a, a smaller firm to promote work-life balance for you. Because work-life balance doesn't necessarily just mean travel. There's a lot that goes into what you personally need in your life. Um, travel may not be always the thing. There are some people who need to be, um, you know, depending on where they are in different stages of career. It could be a single parent. It could be somebody who needs to be home a certain day a week. Uh, they're taking care of parents. They're coaching kids. All these things can enter into the equation of I need to have a little bit of flexibility. You can do it. There's just a lot better ability to do that in a smaller firm than a larger where they need to kind of keep a standard and keep everybody held to that certain standard. Um, I think we talked a little bit about the entrepreneurial stuff. Yeah, I think one thing that was kind of cool about the entrepreneurial, we are building our company at this time. So, you know, you look at that and, you know, I think when I started there were about 25 people in the total company. Now there are, you know, 500, 700, depending on how you count it. We are still, we're still a young company. We're still growing it. We see ourselves as a 100-year company. You know, so there's no sellout. There's no, um, you know, we're going to you know, take this thing and make it go public or something like that. So building it so it's going to last is really fun. And uh, that idea that we're building our company is very entrepreneurial. But also, we work in a lot of small clients. You know, when you're sitting down in a $10 million company, and you've got the owners of the, you know, the business sitting at a table in front of you saying, we don't know how we're going to handle this next thing that's hitting us. Uh, if we can't handle this, we're going out of business next year. You know, what would you do? And it's literally happened to me where you're just sitting in a conference room and you're thinking, this is really how you guys do this stuff? And it, that seems a little informal. I mean, these guys are scared. This is their money. This is their business. If this doesn't work out the right way, and you're thinking, what do I say? And you know, what can I say that's the right answer? It's all about the questions. And it's all about just sitting there and immersing yourself into their world and starting to figure out, how would I save my business? So it's not about trying to be the smart guy. It's just trying to help them think it through and deal with it rationally, which is really kind of fun stuff. Um, and I consider that very entrepreneurial, I guess, in the essence of you know, trying to help them take their business, grow it in a different way than what they might be thinking. Um, we talked about the broader skills. Um, I think, you know, there are cons. So taking away from our utopia a little bit, I guess. Um, you know, you think about this as a, as a new person coming into a consulting company. Training is hard for a small company. So you think about us building a consulting company. We're trying hard, you know, to get our clients, to get a team of people on the ground, to have methodologies that we can deliver to. Training is not something that we can just invest a ton of dollars in and create our own programs. So we leverage training that's already created, but we don't have these big formal programs that turn people into the, you know, the essence of what an Android was at Anderson. Um, so it's hard. There's a lot of on-the-job training. There's a lot of we've got to kind of figure it out on the fly. And as, as a, somebody who would come into a newer consultancy, I think it's something you need to think about too, is what am I looking for? What are the trade-offs in that kind of a thing? Um, having somebody who's willing to sink some dollars into me and really get me trained and ramped up, I might go somewhere, stay two to five years, get that training, get some years of experience, and then move on to the next thing. I'm not encouraging you to job jump, by the way. But, you know, you just kind of have to think about what you're looking for at different stages of your life. But it's harder in a smaller firm to do that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you think about a big company seems like it probably has the ability to weather downturns, things like that. I question that and challenge that a little bit more now. You know, I was at Arthur Anderson. We went out of business. Um, granted, it wasn't, you know, a financial issue necessarily, but uh, financial businesses aren't necessarily always run in the most smart way. I will say a firm like ours, we've learned from that kind of stuff. 
So we have no outside investors. You know, we're 100% employee owned. We, um, we have no debt. And having those types, that type of flexibility and options really can make you smarter in terms of the types of decisions you make about, do you ever have to do a layoff? You know, so even during the bad years, like 2009 was not a great year, we didn't do any layoffs. We don't ever think that we will do a layoff, but we're also smart about how we, how we hire. We don't try to hire a lot of employees anticipating growth and then all of a sudden have a bad year and lay 30% you know, of them off. We try to work with a blend of contractors and employees, stuff like that. So there's a lot that you can do in a small and big company to, to address that stuff. Uh, any other questions that kind of jump out from things that you read behind me? Yeah, please yeah. elaborate more on the layoff uh, that we had on the last slide. It said there's a tendency of frequent layoffs. Oh, uh, go back to the last slide. Just like, so I, I think everybody probably heard that one, uh, elaborating on the, uh, the concept of the layoffs. Um, just similar to what I was mentioning as a kind of a contrast to what we try to do, larger firms are, you know, they're constantly hiring and growing to try to uh, anticipate or address demand. And, you know, business, especially now, if you watch the way the economy goes and the way businesses go, you know, consultants are driven by uh, whatever is going on in the industry. So if the industry is kind of taking a, you know, a fallout or a collapse or business in general is bad, guess what? You know, they don't have, they have money to pay for consultants, so you just get de-scoped. And if you get de-scoped from the project, and there aren't any other projects that are going to pick you up, you, uh, you start to feel like there's a bullseye on your back. And typically, I don't know, it was like a, there was kind of a three-week thing that uh, when times weren't great in the economy, if you were not going to be staffed for a three-week window, you probably ought to be thinking about, you know, getting my notice. At that three week, by the way, is just, that was at that time. I don't know what it is now. But uh, point is, those businesses hire to anticipate what the current demand is, and they have to lay off at a point when that demand drops off. So, not great, but, you know, the economy's good, and, and you're one of the top performers. You hope you're not one of those people, I guess, right? Yes, sir. Is the tier one to um, regional, is that a progression, or are those two independent paths? Uh, uh, great question. So the uh, question being is, you know, tier one versus uh, regional boutique type consulting firms, is it a progression of any sort, or are they just really independent paths? They're really independent paths, which is why we tried to present them that way. Not really trying to present one better than the other. Um, I think it really comes down to um, you start to see a profile of what it is you like or what, you know, what your, your personality lends itself well to in terms of those two different types of models. But those, those tend to be, there are all kinds of variations in between the bookends on, you know, very small firms and very large firms. So, Centric happens to be a small uh, management consulting firm, which in saying that, we have an array of, of services that really span technology and strategy and process improvement. Um, there are other really small firms that are focused specifically on a particular niche or competency. So it might be a mobility development firm. Um, so you know, not all small firms are going to be the same, but these are just generalizations that we've tried to make to help you see the difference. So that would be, you guys would have a tier one and another would have a regional or would you, would one company have both of those different tracks? Typically, it's you know one company. You know, I would see IBM is a tier one type of company. Uh, boutique centric would be to me a kind of a regional or boutique type firm. Um, it's possible that a um, a large firm might have a different division that functions as a little bit more of a boutique like firm. But general, uh, you know, I would just look at a company as a profile. You know, IBM, the big four, uh, Tata, you know, those are tier one type consulting firms. Okay? Yeah. Um, okay, my question is more for, I guess, taking that into consideration for recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a business student, and a lot of us hear about Deloitte Consulting and how you have to have a 3.7 um, to get into it just to see your face. So, um, what is kind of, how does that translate to? I guess your role into recruitment. What do you guys see as something as a team resident? You know, that's a, that question. Yeah, that's a great question. We um, 
what's unique about Centric is, I mean, there's no question, we look at a GPA, no question. Um, does that number determine whether we interview you or not? Not really. We look for, you know, degrees, we want to understand your GPA. What I spend my time really doing is, is interviewing people. Not only do I want to get an understanding of what your background is and, and really what your passions are, but what kind of character quality are you? We talked about culture before. That's really, really important for, for Centric um, to make sure that um, you know, you're a good culture fit. And I think as you start to talk to different companies and interview, really try you know, as much as you can, ask the questions to really understand what does that company stand for? Do they give back to the community? Is that important to me? Really start to make that checklist, if you will, of things or a criteria that's important to you. Um, projects will come and go, clients will come and go, but at the end of the day, it's who do I work for? Who do I represent and who represents me? Um, so yes, degree, great GPA is great, um, but we want to be able to provide that great career path um, and really have those uh, checkpoint meetings to understand what your passions are, to see if we can, if we are the right firm for you. When I interview people, I tell people all the time, I'm here to tell you our story. We might be the right place for you, we might not be, and that's okay. Um, the things that you hear about Centric or different companies that you interview with, it's either gonna resonate with you or it may not. Um, so culture fit, character quality, having that integrity, those are things that are really, really important to, to me and, and to Centric, and that's really what we look for. Uh, I, I don't know if that helped paint a picture. And so people think, well, just, what about my major and stuff like that? And um, Rachel's right, it, it tends to be a little bit more the profile of the individual. And if you think about some of the things we talked about earlier, what do consultants do? Solving problems. I mean. One of the things we will look for through an interviewing process is, how do you solve problems? I mean, do you have a logical way of approaching problems? And uh, you know, critical behaviors that are really important in terms of you know, high initiative, good communicator. Those things happen to be less about things that you um, might have you know, picked up in a programming course and more about how did you approach you know, things that, that took place in a particular course? How did you approach functioning in a team? Um, you know, how do you communicate difficult um, messages to people? And you know, what, how do you deal with conflict? Um, how adaptable are you to you know, unique or new situations? Do you get anxious? Do you like, I kind of like the same thing on a regular basis because it really takes me a while to just get comfortable with something. You know, it's probably, that may not be the best direction. So we really look for a ton of that stuff. Um, you know, I never really figured it out. I had no idea why Anderson Consulting talked to me coming out of school with an engineering degree. You know, they knew that engineers just basically finished a, a five-year program of solving problems. That's all we did. So they loved that. And they looked at GPA. That was a quick way for them to just screen. They figured if you have a really high GPA, you, you care, right? You, you apply yourself and you see things out and they figure you're probably smart as well. Um, I had a number of friends who didn't have the high GPA and they were still pretty smart and very successful where they are in their careers now. So we're, we recognize that it's not just a high GPA, but it is a lot of those other attributes that kind of flow together. And certain degrees or majors really apply well to that. But that's, you know, I think we've hired biology degrees and you, know, you would think, well, that doesn't really apply, does it? It could, depending on the person. Is that helpful? So I think this is it, right? I think this is our last slide. Um, you want to do it? You want to go through it? Uh, go ahead. I've talked a lot. Um, so uh, this really for you, and I would say, as opposed to even going through a lot of this slide, you know, making sure if there are any questions, um, it's not that you have to pick a path of consulting, either tier one or boutique or industry, <laughs> but it's kind of you know, the mission really in terms of picking a path for yourself that might align to one of these things. Rachel talked a lot about you know, it's also screening that company and which one fits you. Which one fits your personality and style. If you're somebody who really wants to travel, there are people that we've turned away who were awesome. They were, you could tell they were going to be great employees and great consultants. 
Like, you know, I really want to travel. You know, where can I go? It's like, you know, you might go to Mason. Um, it's, we don't know, but it's probably going to be, we sell work in our geographies, and you're likely going to go on to one of those projects. So if you're somebody who's like, man, I can't wait to you know, jet set like Andy and go out and have the limo pick me up at the airport and stuff, go to the bigger firm. Um, or a company that just happens to, to do that stuff with you anyhow. But uh, there's a lot, things that I honestly, you know, after I was 14 years into my career, I still didn't really get all the long-term viability stuff. And now with so much that you've seen in terms of good companies that, that just, you know, they haven't made it or their reputation goes bad in some way or they try to go public and then all of a sudden their stock price plummets, you know, really thinking through what is the strategy of this company? Where are they going? Where do I want to be and what do I want to get out of this company? Um, it's just not that typical that people want to go to the same company and work for you know, their 30, 35 years and retire. Um, I would be one of those people, except Arthur Anderson went out of business, so I had to go somewhere else. But you know, I'm probably the tail end of anybody who really thinks that way. Um, so you know, still thinking about what it is you want out of that company for whatever window of time it is. Um, being you know, very deliberate when you're making those decisions. Um, and differences in terms of you know, the financial stability, who they stand for, what they do in their community, uh, all mean a lot. That culture thing, um, you know, these are people you're going to work with every single day. Really understanding what a company thinks makes up its culture and asking those questions of a company will tell you a lot about who they are, what they value, and how you think you might fit in as well. That could be a good interview type question. Um, by the way, the quality thing, we talked about attention to detail or quality on one of the slides earlier. You know, here's the first hint for me. Um, when I see your resume and if there's just a misspelling on it, it just jumps out at me like you wouldn't believe. And it's, I find in college now it's less, it's fewer people that do that. Um, you would be amazed at how many people um, far enough into their career, especially technology majors or, you know, students, because spell check doesn't work on, you know, all these different acronyms and letters they have. But just re read your resume uh, several times. I know it's a boring document to you, um, but it is, it's such a key message that employers look at. Um, I don't know why I had to slip that in there, but that was my public service announcement. Um, what else? I think the rest of these things just talk, kind of talk about things that you should, you know, kind of look at in terms of a company or a profile. But, uh, Anybody else have anything they wanted to add relative to these? Um, I, recently, I, uh, my, my brother, who uh, went to school in North Carolina, a little school called Elon College, um, he'd been working in a career for probably 10, 15 years. I'm not sure how long. How long. But he, came, he called me up and he said, I, I, need, I need to explore a different career path. And he was very focused on the compensation. And um, what we ended up talking through was, you know, really kind of an evaluation model, this checklist that Jeff, you know, and, and Rachel alluded to. And it was almost a, um, we ended up with a scorecard. And it was, you know, do I like to travel? Do I like, you know, a variety of types of engagements? Is compensation important? Is the role Im important? Um, you know, what are, what are all the different, you know, uh, evaluation categories? And then prioritize them and force rank them one through ten, what's most important, what's least important among those. And what he found was compensation actually was not the highest. It was um, his role. He wanted to take on additional leadership responsibilities. And when he mapped the opportunities that were in front of him, he realized that none of those really achieved, the, you know, that his number one and number two priorities and he you know he felt good about the fact that his scoring model had provided some direction on whether or not he should take those jobs um, it's kind of a scientific you know or mathematical way to go about doing it it doesn't always give you the right answer but it gives you some direction and it's a, again it's an easier it's an easy way to break down kind of this complex career discussion into something that's somewhat measurable so that that's what I use that's what I advise you know my brother, my friends, um, I think it's pretty effective and I think that's what we're trying to describe here. You know, understand what are, what are those important things in your, in your life, in your career, and those will change over the, over the duration of your, of your career, right? Um, and periodically reevaluate those and see if you're, if you're doing things that make you happy. Um, 
you know, that's one thing I've learned about Centric is, you know, you, and I, <clears throat> not, not saying I wasn't at Anderson Consulting because I was. Um, to, you know, it's really important that you are doing something that makes you extremely happy. And, you know, money only gives you, so you've heard it, right? Money can't buy you happiness. I mean, um, to a certain extent it probably can, but it doesn't get, make you fulfilled. It doesn't, you know, uh, achieve all of, you know, all of what you're trying to achieve in your career. So, you know, coming up with some kind of model to evaluate those things, comparing them is a really easy way to go about um, understanding where you want to be. Um, I think that's it. We've got some time left for question and answer. If we want to do that. Hold on. One more slide. There's one more? Yeah. No? Oh, well. We had, I thought we had more uh, questions about where uh, you know you're a consultant when. Um, anyway, I think the one that I really liked was the, the, the productivity of your tomato plants you refer to as deliverables. Instead of tomatoes, anyway. It's a consultant joke. Never, never mind. Um, so, does anybody have any questions that we can field? I know there has to be one. Good. Two, immediately. Yes. So, you said um, like biology would be a major that you probably would consider, but like what are normal majors that you would consider for consulting? What are good majors? Yeah, so the question was, um, for example, biology might not be a major that would naturally lead to a consulting career. What are some of the majors? I would say that we have consultants from a whole host of majors, and it's not all technology. It's not all engineering. It just happens that a few of us here have an engineering background, but um, I believe one of our most uh, you know, highly Performing consultants uh, who's actually leading a national practice now for us um, was either a chemistry or biology major, yeah. Aaron Audi. Yeah. Um, I, I use that example not because it was bad or horrible, but more intuitively, a lot of people would think, well, that's not great. It, it can be awesome. You know, it's, uh, yeah, and, and so he is actually using his consulting skills uh, and at the same time going back to get a a uh, degree in bioinformatics, which is a really hot topic and will continue to be so. Um, so he's using his biology and chemistry experience to understand how to do uh, predictive analysis on, you know, biological materials, you know, whether that be uh, materials in your body, uh, you know, petroleum products, um, and, and, and understanding how to analyze that, um, create these big data models and slice and dice that information to do some predictive analysis on how to improve performance of synthetics and things like that. So um, it's not programming. I mean, it is truly applying that biology and chemistry experience to solving, you know, new world problems. We have marketing majors, history majors that are all wildly successful consultants. What I would tell you is even if consulting isn't your, isn't your gig, um, no matter what you do when you get out of college, technology will be a component of it. So I would strongly encourage you to have some familiarity with what's going on in the technology space. That might be as simple as using Microsoft Office products or your Mac or, or smartphone, <laughs> right? Um, um, but the reality is that um, you know, technology is, you know, more so than ever is taking over, you know, that's the wave of the future, right? And, and big data and how you, how you use big data to make more informed business decisions and things like that. I'm guessing they're probably all more technology advanced than we are here. Yeah. Absolutely. I call our technology support desk <laughs> once a week, I think. Um, but yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what major you're in. I mean, if there's a, if there's a passion there and that you want to be an industry expert, uh, a, a biology expert, and you know, there are consulting firms that um, specialize in that. I work with a, uh, a, a woman in, in Cincinnati. She, start, she was in a big consulting firm. She left, started her own uh, design practice, and um, built her business up to where she was bought out. Uh, and 
ended up starting another practice, and she has done some of the most amazing design things uh, for Nike and Adidas and um, uh, BMW. Um, I mean, just some really cool you know, graphic design, digital design type stuff. And she did not have a technology background. It was purely you know, graphic arts type work. Um, so I actually had the light coming to a class that I was in this last week randomly, and they one of the things they talked about, and I don't know if it's just them because they're Deloitte saying it and they're trying to put their whatever better than other consulting firms, but that they or the big firms come into um, a business or a company and they'll like think of what the best ways to answer the problems, and then they kind of go a step further, and not only think of the best ways and tell the company the best way to do it, but actually have more ability to implement it. Is that something that's true and that smaller companies do less actual implementation of the new ideas or processes that they suggest to a company they're working in? So let me see if I have your question right. <laughs> Deloitte randomly shows up at a, at a class and they um, and what they talk about is their differentiator, right? Which is not only do they come in and help understand a problem, but they can also take it one step further and help implement solutions to solve those problems. Is that yes. accurate? Yes. More in terms of they have more capacity to do that because they're a bigger company. I'm going to let Steve answer because he's an ex Deloitte guy. <laughs> so the answer is yes, they do have that capability. Um, but most consulting organizations, will typically provide those similar capabilities. So for example, from a centric perspective, you know, we will span the gamut of, we may be able to uh, come in because they only want us to deliver a specific solution. They don't want us to devise the overall, uh, develop the overall solution. They've maybe developed it already. They want help just executing it. Or we can come in from a strategy perspective, think about how should you run your organization? How should you operate your organization? Um, and take it from conception even to execution. Um, so, I mean, the easy answer is yes, they do it. The IBMs will do it. The uh, Accentures do it. Um, and even the small organizations like us will do it as well. Um, that's, that's the short answer for it. Yeah, so uh, from, a, from a scale perspective, that, that's a great point. Um, those organizations are typically going to come in, the Deloitte's of the world um, can scale very quickly, uh, meaning they can drop a number, dozens um, of individuals at a client site at a given point in time, um, pretty, uh, pretty short uh, time frame. Whereas the smaller organizations, very large uh, pro projects that we need to scale for 10, 20, 30 people, it is a little tougher for us to scale because we don't have people just sitting on the bench. We keep a, a fairly lean uh, bench as far as folks that are available for, for projects. The key, uh, the key for Centric is going to be we want those individual staffed on projects, uh, whereas the Deloitte's will have that large bench strength behind them to say we can drop in those 40, 50 people on a very large um, project to scale appropriately. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you guys typically work in teams? So the, the, the question is do we typically work in teams? Um, that's a great, great question. And um, for Typically what occurs, our project teams are anywhere between one to four to five individuals. Um, and the duration of those projects uh, tend to be about two to three months in duration. Um, what, we, what we try to do is um, we will make investments at a client to get in on the ground to uh, identify opportunities and begin to grow that account. Um, we do have projects that we had um, a project over in um, just outside of Indianapolis that we had I think about 100. 100 individuals on the project, right? Um, so, you know, we can scale, we will scale appropriately, uh, but that those average projects are anywhere between that one to four, maybe five individuals, um, depending upon the, the type of project it is, um, a, as well as the, the industry, or at least the, the size of the organization. I mean, but you're in the client team too, right? Yeah. yeah so, um, I mean, even if you're an individual consultant on a project team, you're still working with the client. I mean, there's very few instances where you are, you know, kind of go and kind of put your head down and work by yourself. So working in teams, you know, I look at it as, yeah, you've got the people that you know that you work with on a, a regular basis, but really just being able to fit into any kind of group of people and function in a, in a team type of environment, 
every single project you're on. My guess is that your question was a little bit more how big of our teams, yeah. but uh, I, I think they're both pretty relevant. Sure. Someone had, yeah. Uh, what kind of services do you guys offer your clients and what industries? So what kind of services do we offer and in what industries? Will? So, uh, there's, I think there's a slide in here Jeff's going to go to, but Centric's growing from that standpoint, right? So we've kind of got it broken down into a couple of industry verticals and some uh, different solutions or service offerings, right? So they touched on before, we do a lot of business consulting um, as well as technology consulting. So we kind of look at these and, and you know, have, have picked off what are the most important uh, service offerings that we can have. Uh, really based on the market and our skill sets and, and kind of where we sell in the regional markets, right? So we talked a lot about um, business intelligence before, right, and data analytics. Um, that's a big service offering for us. Another is uh, business process management and some of these BPM tools that, that allow you to move the work from one place to another. Another is obviously mobile and some of these different technologies. Um, we also have some industry verticals that we've gotten into. And so we take them from, you know, both of these from different stages, kind of an emerging or, or an entrepreneurial to what we get to what we call commercialized and we maybe have more resources that can support it and, and, and uh, uh, deeper knowledge and, and bandwidth in that area. So our industry verticals we've hit, uh, Andy talked about a little bit before, but one of our, one of our BUs is, is energy and utilities. Um, so obviously we're big in that industry. Um, we are in uh, insurance, um, largely, especially in Cincinnati, there's a lot of insurance companies. Um, we're getting into financial services and some of these others. So we, um, what are the other IVs that I'm missing? Healthcare. Healthcare is another big one, obviously. So we, uh, we look, you know, specifically as a smaller firm and we're trying to say which markets do we want to play in and what are the best opportunities for growth. And some of that's based on, you know, the regional markets as well. I'll add to that. What's really neat about um, what we do at Centric is the fact that we've been able to be the size that we are and we have the capability to sit down with our employees and really understand, you know, what do you want to do? What are you passionate about? Here's what you're doing today. But what does it look like, you know, one, two, five plus years from now? Um, and we're able to really sit down and, and, and carve out that career path um, and partner with you um, to get you where you want to be. So if you are a, you know, developer today in Java and you want to go to, you know, more of the mobile Android iOS, let's sit down and talk about that. And so that's one unique thing about um, you know Centric or you know a smaller firm that we have the capability to really spend time and invest, um, and that's something that you know is, is very very important to to us at Centric. So, just I mean, just to knowing, I think you guys were supposed to be able to wrap up at 7:30, and people being very respectful of your time. You know, if you want to depart, uh, we're not going to be offended or anything else. If you want to stay, we'll stay here for a long time too. So it's really up to you guys. But however many questions you have, we'll stay till you're done. But when do you feel good? And if you want to leave or anything, it's fine. Any other Uh, that's a great question. So the question being, how do we grow our business? What's our basis of, of business development and sales? And how are people, who's involved in that in terms of the consultants and others? And Steve's probably one of the best <laughs> at it. <laughs> so um, as far as kind of how we grow our client base, there, there's a couple different avenues. So let's take an existing account that we may be working in. So for example, I'm working downtown at Omnicare in Cincinnati. So um, part of my role is to build the account through just networking within the account, have the conversations, what are the business challenges, what are the business issues that are occurring within the client, um, and begin to identify you know, how we may be able to, to help them, both short term and long term. Um, that is kind of the, from a, from a leadership perspective, um, that's kind of the responsibility of myself. Um, in addition though, we also have account managers at our, at our clients as well. So there will be an individual, typically kind of a manager, senior manager. Um, he or she is leading one of the larger initiatives, larger projects, uh, maybe multiple projects at a client. Um, he or she is, is going to be responsible just for 
um, similar types of, of capabilities and conversations as far as what's happening on my project, what's happening across the different either lines of business or, or within the different organizations of the, uh, of the company and trying to understand how can we bring potential services, service offerings, or specific industry expertise into that organization just to help um, apply additional credibility into what we do and how we do things. And then there's the other, the other piece is a consultant, a senior consultant. They're just actively in the throes of a project, but they're actively listening. And I think Andy or Jeff, I forget who it was, that talked a little bit about earlier is listening skills are so critical. You can pick up so much from conversations or from meetings that you may have as far as, um, you, may not, you may not be talking about a, a specific opportunity, but they may be saying, boy, we're having issues in this area. Not sure really what's going on. You know, kind of the lights go off. And when people talk about issues or maybe we have this opportunity, it's a short answer to say, you know, hey, would you like to have a conversation? Would you like to go to lunch? So it's, it's, it's at all levels within the organization and within their organization and our organization where we're actively um, looking for opportunities on how we can partner with them. And the key thing is, is if we don't think we're a good fit for the organization from a project perspective, you know, we will help them understand and maybe give them advice on who they may talk to in addition to Centric Consulting. I think that's the beauty um, that Andy mentioned earlier. It's all about partnership with us, not about just getting a project, selling a project, delivering a project. It's how do we truly become a, a business partner with them and talk about their issues and how we can help them. Um, we also then, the, the, the last piece from a kind of a client base in business, in business development is truly, we have a couple individuals that that's what they focus on. They focus on trying to get into organizations that we aren't currently in today. Um, and that would be through, um, primarily through networks. Um, you will not find us picking up a phone and just cold calling organizations. That's not how we work. We actually are, are always about networking. Where do we have friends, family, um, or organizations that we've done work in the past that we may be able to leverage some contacts to help us make some, a warm introduction. Any, any other comments? Did that answer your question? Anything else? Thank you so much.